John chapter 16 is our scripture verse this morning. As we listen to it, it's a warning from our, our Lord and Savior, originally to his disciples, but uh, the original apostles, but I, I think it applies to us too. John 16, 2 and 3 is a, a warning for us. They'll, they'll put you out of the synagogues. He was talking to guys who were originally Jewish at that day. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever kills you will think that he does God a service. And these things will they do unto you because they've not known the Father nor me. Let us pray. Lord, we do thank you for the word of God today. As we read it by faith and receive it by faith, Lord, we ask you to speak to us and give us ears that we may hear what the Spirit says to the church. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, Susan told this story years ago, and I hadn't forgot it. And it was, I asked her again this past week if it's okay to tell it. She had told it to me. Uh, it was when her son, her oldest son, her oldest child, Jonathan, was uh, like a toddler. How old is John now? Forty? Forty years old. But it's been a while ago. <laughs> yes, I could have left that part out, she said. But she was going out to work one morning in a hurry to go, going out the front door to go to work, and I guess going to drop John off at the, uh, at the, daycare place or something you know how it is in the morning you're in a rush and trying to get to work and do everything and she come bursting out the door and she turned her foot over and she hit the ground and she realized she had broken her foot and she couldn't get up couldn't walk on it and she looked and her her son just started crying and he said well, i don't know the number to 911 <laughs> But he did know that 911 means there's an emergency, right? And the, the, by the way, if anybody don't know the number to 911, <laughs> it is 911. <laughs> That's all you need to know. But after September the 11th, today's September the 11th, after September the 11th, 2001, 911 also took on another meaning, didn't it? And I remember the, the slogan back then in the original days following 911. Remember, we said, We'll never forget. We'll never forget. And we, we have a tendency to do that, though, don't we? I hope that as long as I'm alive and I'm your pastor, you'll never forget because I won't let you forget. But it, it's sort of interesting as I was thinking about the math of that. It's been, uh, what is that, 21 years ago today? Is that, I'm not good at math. That's right. It's 21 years ago. So then I was thinking about. Uh, when I came into the world in April of 1962, it was actually closer to the Pearl Harbor event than it is this side of my life looking back at 911. Can you believe that? It was like just barely 20 years ago when Pearl Harbor happened in, in December 1941 when I was born. But when I, a few years later when I got to school and they started teaching us about Pearl Harbor, of course, as, uh, as it is for young people, that seemed like really ancient history to me. And, and probably to Darby, <laughs> September 11, 2001, it was like ancient history. But for some of us, on the other hand, it just seems like it was just the other day, wasn't it? We, we say we'll, we'll never forget. So in Pearl Harbor, I looked up these statistics this week, and I, I wrote them down to make sure I, I got it right. In, in Pearl Harbor, there were 2,403 people killed in that unprovoked attack by the Japanese. 2,403 people were killed, including 68 of those were civilians. On September the 11th, 2001, there were 2,977 people killed. Civilians. And now, a little over 20 years later, we're just about to outstrip that number by the people that are still dying from the diseases and things that were caused from the dust and everything in it. That is a major event, and we should never forget that. But at the same time that we're never forgetting, we should look back and say, well, what is the lesson that 911, what should we learn from 911? And I look back and I said, well, first of all, it was committed by a religion gone wild. Not all Muslims are terrorists, but all those terrorists were Muslims. 
that had taken their religion to the nth extreme and in the name of Allah were going to destroy us. Now, there's a lesson for all of us to learn there because that can happen in any religion, even the true religion. For instance, uh, Judaism in the first century when Jesus was walking the land had done the same thing. It had, gone, it had taken the, the, the religion that God gave us in the first 39 books of the Bible and they'd really kind of got away from God and, and they'd got into the thing where politics was the agenda for everybody. You take the, uh, the Sanhedrin in that day. Remember the Bible tells us that the Sanhedrin, which is a branch of Judaism, they had decided to, they'd come to the point that they didn't believe in angels, they didn't believe in demons, they didn't believe in spirits, they didn't leave, believe in a resurrection of any kind. They were simply a political wing of the Judaism church, if you would. Now, the Pharisees, they were closer to us. You know, they were the conservative Bible believers, so to speak, but they had turned into such a legalistic system that uh, they had really missed the point and gotten away from God, too. They're the ones that crucified Jesus or had him crucified by the Romans, but they were behind it all. They're the ones that the Gospels is all about, that Jesus was constantly uh, bantering with and in conflict with and were setting him up, moving him toward the cross every time. They were more about their political power than they were about the religion of God, and that's why they missed the, the Messiah himself. And there, there was that third group that we don't read much about the Bible, but there was another sect in that time of Judaism called the Essenes. They're the ones that gave us the Dead Sea Scrolls because they had just moved out into the wilderness and they were going to wash their hands with everything and they were just going to be out there and everybody leave them along and they'll, they'll believe in God their own way. I'd probably went with the Essenes back then. <laughs> just go out in the woods somewhere and just forget about the rest of the world and I'll practice my religion, religion about out here. But that wasn't God's will either. But... That's kind of what happened. In that. But that was Judaism. But you know what? Christianity can do the same thing if it's not careful. Christianity can, can miss the, the whole point of the religion of Jesus Christ. All we've got to do is look back in history and we look at the, how many people died in the Crusades in the name of Christ. Or in the Inquisition when the Split in the church eventually occurred, but uh, people didn't believe exactly like the Pope did. And, that the, you know, they were being burned at the stake in the name of Christ because they thought they were doing God a favor. We need to always remember this. On January 6th of 2020-2021, I dare say that most of those people that attacked their own capital were professing Christians, upset that things didn't go their way, and five people died that day, or soon after it, because they forgot that our weapons are not carnal, they're spiritual, but they're mighty to the tearing down of strongholds. But we wrestle not against flesh and blood, Ephesians 6, 12 says. We, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. See, they went in there to wrestle and fight against flesh and blood. But that's not Christianity. That's not. This is what happens, though, when people don't stick close to the book, the Bible. If we stray too far around, it means uh, we forget. We have a tendency to forget. But we should never forget that we're supposed to love our enemies. We should never forget that we're supposed to do unto others as we would have them do unto us. We should never forget that we are supposed to pray for those who would despitefully use you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for his sake. We should never forget that Jesus said we're supposed to bless those who curse you. Bless and not curse, he said. But the serpent is subtle. And by that, it means this. The devil can mess with you and you not even be aware that he's doing it. He's subtle.
I'm a conservative Christian, and that does carry over into my politics, but yet we should never get to the point where the church tries to substitute the ballot box for prayer. And sometimes we jump the rails and we, we get there. Wednesday night we begin a new book of the Bible as we begin to study the Gospel of Mark. And it dawned on me the first time, I've, I don't know, tell how many times I've taught, taught, taught Mark, but you know how you read the Bible over and over and something new will jump out at you? As we look, just went briefly through the, uh, quickly through the first chapter of Mark the other day, and, and Mark does that. Mark moves really fast. And he began to tell us, he moved through the story of, of John the Baptist being the forerunner. Then he began to get to Jesus' is calling his disciples. He calls three or four disciples there in, in Mark. And then all of a sudden he's telling us about this miracle and that miracle and that miracle. He's casting out demons and he's healing these people over here. And in the midst of this big list, it's almost like Mark is uh, assembling a list of miracles that Jesus did as, he began, as his fame began to go abroad into the country. And then you can read it so fast that you'll miss a very important line there. It's right in the middle of chapter 1. It said, rising up a great while before day, he went out into a solitary place, and there Jesus prayed. And it just hit me the other day. Mark was talking about how Jesus was tapped into the power of God. And then if you don't watch it, you'll miss it. Here's how he's tapping into the power of God. He's going out before daylight that morning and getting away from everybody and everything else. And he's spending time in prayer with the Father. That's where our power's at. And we want to substitute something else for it. The serpent's subtle. He can mess with you and he don't even do We should remember that, that he's, the serpent's subtle. We should remember this, that Christians were, here's a word that I didn't hear until recently with the social media thing, influencers. People are influencers. And I thought, you know, that's what the church is. We need to be reminded that the church is to be influencers, not forcers. We want the whole world to be Christian. But we can't force that on anybody. Even God lets people make up their own mind. But we are to be influencers to the people that we're around, wishing that everybody would live as Christians. But the influence for Christ comes through love. The Holy Spirit generally doesn't work through anger. But God will work through love, won't he? Our text tells us that one day in the future that the world will kill Christians, I, I believe. And you might think, well, that can't happen. Well, don't forget about 911. <laughs> don't forget what Hitler did to the Jews. Yet, sadly, I think it may come through our own government, <laughs> ultimately. People that don't agree with you, Christian. People have just about had enough of you, Christian, because their opinion is not what the Bible is, and you're going to stand for the Bible, and they can't understand it. Or perhaps it will come through the false church. See, the, the false church is going to hate the true, true church, too. We're seeing it splitting and dividing up now that our opinions are worth more than the Bible, is what they say. But even in the true church, when we get misguided and things get out of hand, people want to use the Bible to prop up what they are passionate about but dismiss the part that goes the other way. We're going to use the Bible to prop up our agenda, but we're going to ignore that thing about blessing and not cursing and loving and your enemies. All that. See what I mean? It's subtle. It can happen to us too, can it? But the Bible never says that the Christians are to kill the world. The world and all these things, whether it's the false government or the false Christian, false church or whatever else, it, that, that may end up be the end time demise of the Christians. Christians never kill them. Christians never kill the world. It's just like the government in the first century killed the Christians and killed Christ. 
All that was done through the Roman government, right? Through the system. The false church, the Pharisees of the day, used the systems to have him killed and to persecute the church. You ever notice history's got a way of repeating itself too? And ultimately, it may, may do so again. But yet, the Christian response is, now here's the tough part. The Christian response is that the Bible teaches us that if we're willing to die for our Christianity, that's our greatest witness. The first century Christians took it to be an honor if they could die for Christ. They didn't go out looking to be killed, but they didn't back down in their faith either. I guess the bottom line is this. uh, Are you brave enough to follow Jesus? And if you are, one of those forgotten, neglected verses of the Bible is if you are, take up your cross and follow him. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for the word of God. May we be brave enough, if called upon, to take up our own cross and follow Jesus to death. Because we know that death is just a blip on the radar screen of eternity. And we know what's on the other side. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.